Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Wall's End History Story. This week I am covering the story of the incorporation of the Borough of Wall's End. However, I know that most of this is what I call technical stuff or in other words, legal details. Something that is quite hard to understand and would be a little bit boring. So I will include a few of the more interesting details from the petition and then cover the celebrations that took place after the incorporation was improved in 1901. It's not actually meant to be the full details of everything, it's just a little insight into some of the things that went on at the time. I hope you will still find it interesting. The application, which was known as a Petition for Incorporation, was first seen by Queen Victoria in 1898. Some of the interesting details from this are as follows. In 1861, the census said that 2,371 people lived in Wall's End. By 1871, the figure was 4,169. In 1881, it was 6,351. And in 1891, it had risen to 11,620. And by the time the petition was put in, the estimated amount of people living in Wall's End was 18,192. This gives a good example of how quickly Wall's End was growing as a town. Industry in the town had grown and this was attracting people to the area for work. The total number of houses in Wall's End in 1898 is 4,127 which would have each home with an estimated number of inhabitants at 4.4 people. Since 1891, various street improvements have been made at a cost of £19,000 and plans for building 650 houses have been passed and 375 of those will be flats to allow two families to live in each building. The main trades in the town are shipbuilding, ship repair works, engineering, coal mining, building and agriculture, shipping, river traffic and ferries. The River Tyne is now seen as one of the most important rivers in the world, especially in regard to imports and exports. It is also seen as one of the chief shipbuilding ports in the world. The number of workmen employed in shipbuilding, marine and general engineering in the town is between five and 8,000. Not all of the workmen currently live in Wall's End, but it is said that they are moving into the houses as fast as they can be built. Queen Victoria had been in agreement with the petition. However, time was needed to allow for any petitions to be put in against the scheme and by this time she had died, so it had not been signed and sealed. So it was King Edward VII who granted the charter for the incorporation in 1901, which was the first one to be granted under his reign. By November of 1901, the first elections for the councillors of the municipal borough of Wall's End had taken place. Wall's End was then split into six wards and three councillors were needed for each ward. The wards at the time were Northumberland, Wall's End, Holy Cross, Carville, Buddle and Hadrian Ward. And the first councillors for the town were Holy Cross Ward, S.T. Harrison, G. Drury and Robert Irwin Dees, Hadrian Ward, M. Murray, J. Davison and T. G. Morpeth, Northumberland Ward, J. Giles, J. Allen and R. H. Jackson, Carville Ward, W. Giles, G. A. Allen and G. Elliot, Wall's End Ward, J. O'Hanlon, T. Snaith and R. A. Hall, and finally Buddle Ward, A. Thompson, C. Stevenson and J. Duffy. The next step, of course, was the new mayor of the borough of Wall's End. It would seem that this was something the council had decided upon long before the borough had been formed. They had always been sure that the first mayor should be Mr William Boyd. He was nominated by councillor John Giles and this was seconded by councillor Harrison. 
The motion was quickly passed and William Boyd went down in history as the first mayor of the borough of Wall's End. The deputy mayor was to be Alderman Allen. At this time, the council were using a room in the Masonic Hall for their council chambers, as the town hall was not yet built. I won't go into that here though, as I have already covered the story of the building of the town hall in another video. So the very first meeting was held in the Masonic Hall. After his election as mayor, William Boyd then went on to talk about some of the history of War's End. A couple of the things that I found interesting were his details about the village green, and he had stated that the original town, which stood on the site of Segedunum and was built, in his words, out of the ruins of the Roman fort, had fallen victim to the plague, and those living there had decided to rebuild a new village a fair distance away from the old one, and so Wall's End Village Green was born. Sadly, he does not give any details of when the first houses were built, but some of those on the green are the oldest buildings in Wall's End, not all of them of course as some are much later builds. I don't actually remember hearing this story about the original village or about when Wall's End Green was first built, so if anyone knows any more about this, please do let me know as I might even use that in a future story. He also talked of the monks of Jarrow crossing the Tyne on stepping stones to get to Holy Cross Chapel. Of course, the Tyne at the time was not as deep or as wide as it is today. It seems he was a man of considerable knowledge about Wall's End, and it feels to me a real shame that he never wrote a book about all the things he knew. After this meeting, a luncheon was held, but I won't go into details as it was mostly all speeches congratulating the many councillors and the other well-known people of the town. William Boyd, just as a little bit of extra information, was born in Yorkshire in around 1839. He moved to Wall's End in around 1874, and from then on he was very involved in the town and its growth. He does not seem to have ever actually lived in Wall's End, census details give his homes as Longbenton and Jesmond, but he clearly loved the place. He retired from council life in around 1906, and in his later years he moved away from the area, dying in Cheltenham in 1919, and he is buried in St Mary with St Matthew's Churchyard in Cheltenham. In December of 1901, the first civic procession of the borough took place. It was known as Mayor's Sunday. The procession walked from the council chambers, which as mentioned earlier were currently at the Masonic Hall, to the Church of St Peter's, where a service was held by Canon Henderson. It was said that the church was full to capacity and that hundreds of people had been turned away as there simply wasn't room for them all inside. It was said to be a lovely day despite it being winter and many people had lined the roads to watch the procession pass by and after the service everyone walked back to the Masonic Hall with the same crowds watching them pass by on their return. This would be the first of many Mayor's Sundays. A few other events also took place in 1901, one of those being the Mayor's Banquet. It was certainly a year full of celebration and it did not end in 1901, as in August of 1902, the Mayor and Mayoress held a garden party in Wall's End Park. The use of the park for this party had been granted by the Wall's End Town Council, though I doubt very much that they would have actually refused this. The weather was said to be a little on the dull side, but everyone was thankful that it did not rain, and it was said to be a very successful day. In the afternoon, the mayoress planted an oak tree to commemorate the coronation of King Edward VII. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually say where the tree was planted, but I do wonder if it is still in the park today. During Roman times, apparently, Wall's End had been famous for its oak trees. The mayoress was given a silver trowel as a memento of the occasion. The garden party had been by invitation only and it seems it had been very well attended and as much as I would love to read the names of those who were there it would take quite some time as there are around 202 names on the list 
but it did include several of the mayors and mayoresses from the surrounding towns and people like Robert Richardson Dees, Dr Aitchison and the Mordew family to name just a couple. It seems that the garden party was a very fitting end to the celebrations of the incorporation of the borough of Wall's End. I will end with a little description of the borough coat of arms. This was a design that had been suggested by Mr. C. J. Bates and it's described as being an eagle copied from a Roman sculpted stone found in Rochester and it is shown standing on a wall to incorporate the idea of the Roman wall which gives the town its name. And the black background is said to symbolise the coal mining industry of Wall's End, which had been a very significant and important part of the growth of Wall's End. The motto is not something that I am going to attempt to pronounce, but you should be able to see it on screen at the moment so you can try it out for yourself. I hope you have found this little story interesting. When War's End became a borough, it seems almost everyone in the town celebrated the occasion. The celebrations would happen again on the 50-year anniversary in 1951, which is a subject that I might just cover in another story. Thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.